praise the name of Jesus. Amen. It is good to be in the house of the Lord. We've had a great time of worship. Now it's time to get into God's Word. Amen. And he's called us to that. And so today we're going to go to Titus uh, chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. And uh, as I'm opening up here, let me tell you, we will be focusing more on 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We're talking about the rapture today. Uh, but it talks about the blessed hope, and that's what we got from this text here. And I'll make a couple comments, but we will be going to 1 Thessalonians chapter uh, 4. And, uh, and we will have several different verses today that we're going to speak of and go to today. All right, so starting in Titus chapter 2, if my people would stand, if you would, as we just open up the word. We're going to begin reading in, in Titus chapter 2, verse 11, reading through verse 14. Also Paul speaking to us through inspiration of the Holy Spirit. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Looking for that blessed hope, and of course that's my title name, our blessed hope. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purifying to himself a peculiar or a special people, zealous of good works. It's talking about us. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. Holy Spirit, come and do that work that only you can do in our hearts, in our minds. Transform our minds where they need it. Remind us in our hearts, Lord, in our minds, those things that maybe we hadn't thought of in a while. Bring your word to us, O oh Lord, in a way that, oh God, that it will be a blessing. Manifest yourself, Holy Spirit, as only you can do. And we thank you for it by faith. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. You may be seated. I was thinking about this week and couldn't help it with all of us thinking about the politics of the time, how messed up our world is. And, and if we're trusting in a president or if we're trusting in our government or if we're trusting in any kind of system, I think that it's going to be our hope. Uh, I got another thing to say to all of us. Our time here is short overall, and our hope is eternity. Our hope is the Lord Jesus Christ. Our hope is what scriptures tell us to think about and look to, which is our blessed hope today. And as I was thinking about this this week, I was reminded, for me, of the importance of especially with stuff going on around us, how messed up this world is, and the belief also that we believe we're in the end of time. We need to be looking up for our Savior, the blessed hope. And so that's what this text is talking about, the second coming of Jesus Christ. Included within that, I'm not trying to get into a into a uh, end-time teaching of uh, events. Uh, well, let's just put the blessed hope as the second coming of Christ, the the scripture talks about his appearing and so on, which if it's for us now, if he came right now, it'd be the rapture for me and you, and that's what we're talking about today. And before we go to First Thessalonians, you might want to turn there, chapter 4, but he makes a comment here. He says that grace has appeared to all men, so no, nobody will have an excuse. No one. Grace has appeared to all mankind. In other words, God says, I've revealed myself one way or the other by his spirit, by the Bible, by 
somebody on TV or you listen to the gospel by accident, even on the radio, we've all had grace revealed unto us. And of course, we the church know that. And he's saying here that the grace also tells us that our lives should be lived not with ungodly lust and desires of this world, but our lives should be lived for God and for godliness. And so he speaks here of some holiness that we don't hear preached about much in the church today. While we wait and look, and let me just read that key verse, verse 13, one more time before we go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. While we're here living this life for God, he says, looking for that blessed hope. We're going to talk about that. That's our hope. This old world isn't our hope. If you haven't figured that out by now, uh, you better figure it out soon. And the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. That is an amazing statement. Right here it tells us about the deity of Jesus Christ. We're looking for him to come back. But he calls him the great God. Our great God. The Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for us to redeem us. Died on the cross for me and for you. All right, we're going to be talking about the blessed hope, the rapture primarily today. Uh, last week, I, uh, we're going to go to 1 Thessalonians now, but last week uh, I spoke about in Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, seek those things that are above, set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. Kind of brought me, just kind of easily just kind of brought me to, well, looking up, and we're looking for the return of our Lord. Amen? And so uh, we're going to read Starting in 1 Thessalonians, we're going to read in verse 13. I was going to do less, but the purpose of this text was that it was about 20 years uh, after Christ had already ascended up into his place beside uh, his father on the throne. About 20 years later, many of the Christians now had begun passing away and going on. And many of the church people were wondering, well, what about my brother, my mother, my father, I mean, they believed, and they, they died, and Jesus still hadn't come back, and then some were concerned. There were some teachings, of course, as there always will be, the devil will try to intervene. There were some teachings about uh, that there was no resurrection. Paul speaks of that, and I think it was in uh, 1 Corinthians. But but we, we believe and we know there's a, a coming back of the Lord Jesus, and so uh, let's go ahead and read that text, starting in verse 13. He's, again, trying to reply to all those questions they had because Jesus hadn't come back yet. What about their loved ones? So chapter 4, starting in verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, or those that are dead, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. That word hope stands out to me strongly in all these scriptures that we we look for today. We have hope, and that's what keeps us going, should keep us going. Verse 14. For if we hope that Jesus died, no, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep, those that are dead, in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. So he's speaking Definitely by inspiration, there's no doubt he's saying by, by the word of the Lord, what God has said. That we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent or stop them that are asleep or fallen asleep that are dead. 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel. And the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall, shall we ever be with the Lord. And then he makes this a statement which we could easily just not go to because that's the end of his description of the rapture. But then he says this. Wherefore comfort one another. So I want to comfort you today. Comfort one another with these words. And here's my comfort to you. Jesus is coming back. He's our hope. We 
need to be looking for him. All the scriptures tell us to look for him. Paul spoke about it a lot. He, they were looking for him way back then. It was 2,000 years ago. Peter speaks about it, that because time has gone by, he said, many are going to mock and say everything keeps on going as it always has. But I want to tell you, yes, it has. It doesn't matter who the president is when it comes to life going on as it always has, it will. Life will keep going on. There is going to be a day, though, when our Lord and Savior is going to come back. And he's going to, he's going to handle things like you've never seen it handled. It's not going to be like it is now. It's going to be handled in righteousness and by our Lord himself. I can remember over 30 years ago, uh, I was not a pastor at the time, and I was, I was uh, visiting different businesses for the work that I did. And I remember going into this office and in the waiting room, and, and I saw this gentleman that I knew fairly well. I'd known him for years. I'd been socialized with him, but I knew him real well. And we got in a conversation. I think he'd begin going to church. He wasn't a Christian yet. And uh, I don't even know if I considered that at the moment. But we began talking about something. And somehow the second coming of, of, of the Lord came. And I got on that subject. And I got excited. Here we are in this waiting room. I, I, I look back. I don't even remember if there was other people in the room. But uh, here I was telling him about the rapture. I said, man, I said, why are you worried about all that stuff? I mean, Jesus is coming back, and we're going to be out of this old place, you know? And I just tell him what the Scripture said, because I, I wasn't sure he knew it, you know, what the Scripture said. And, and so that passed, and I went on my way after my work that day. And I don't remember any comments back and forth from him or anything of that nature. Well, anyway, about a year later or two years later, I went and took my little girl, I, I think it was uh, I think it was my youngest one, it may have been both of them played t-ball, but we were at t-ball practice, and, and I went out from the car, and it was the first practice, and, and, and I went out and stood against the fence and was watching them as they were beginning to, to do their practice, and all of a sudden, here came Bob, the guy that I talked to a year or two earlier in that office that day, and he, he brought up the conversation that I had that day with him in the office. And he says, you know, I thought you were crazy. He, he, you know, he wasn't a Christian. He says, I thought you were crazy. He said, then later, he says, I got saved. And he said, man, he says, that's powerful stuff, isn't it? Jesus Christ is coming back. And, and he was all, he got excited. Us just standing there on the fence talking about it. And I, I got excited with him. And I said, yeah. I said, so you didn't believe it when I told you? And he, he said, well, no, I hadn't really even heard of it. So he says, man, that's exciting stuff, isn't it? That's almost like Star Wars or whatever. And so we, we had a good time, and it was neat to know that I touched him that day. I'm sure that made him think, you know, about the Scripture. But Jesus is coming back. He's coming back. Now, I, I decided today that, that a good thing maybe to do it through the years. I, there's been times when I, uh, as I'm reading my Scriptures, I'll put points together, and I may make little notes on something. And I began years ago just kind of putting down some Scriptures about the rapture that I thought told us why. Why we it's the rapture. And so I'm going to give you some of those scriptures and thoughts on it, just some brief thoughts. And uh, I've got seven of them. Now let me make this comment about those scriptures. I don't have them in any special order um, of importance, you might say, because obviously they're all important, but, but, uh, but I tried to put them, in fact, a couple of them I put together only because they're in the same text and we don't have to go back and forth in, in the Word. So, so it's not of any certain importance that I've got these seven for you, and, and it may not be totally complete, you know? And I know there's other little factors that you can say, well, what about this, too? You know, and all those little things, but they probably fit in pretty much to most of these. So I'm going to go through those seven, and the first one is, uh, is I want us to understand that it has to be for the plan of God to be fulfilled for the fulfillment of Scripture according to what we have in the Bible, it has to be. There has to be a moment in time where this age will end. I'm going to read Scripture to you. You don't need to turn it. I'm going to read a, a Scripture to you on this and just in uh, Romans 11, chapter 25, because it's got another interesting thought in it as well. 
I'm just going to read that to you. You don't have to turn there. But, uh, but it says this. It says, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. It would appear for me, and I just took one scripture, there's several that point to the fact that there's going to be a conclusion to this thing. I just took one scripture here. What stood out to me in the scripture was until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. I believe that the church age is basically primarily meant it's a Gentile age. There are different seasons. We call them, I think we call them dispensations, a, 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 a time period, Christian time period that we call is a certain time period it goes from one time period to another where God may even manage things a little differently. For instance, you have the time period from Adam to Moses. No law, right? From Adam until Moses, you know, which is about 1,500 years before Christ. You have a time period there that, that, you, that you have no law. You could even break that down more, but it's not for our purpose. But you could break that down from Adam to, to Abraham, who was 400 years before the law, and from Abraham possibly to Moses. So you could say, well, there's different, you know, different aspects here, different periods. And then you have the time from Moses of the law until the time of the cross, the church age, basically. That is a distinct time period of the law being fulfilled until it finishes. And Jesus even made the comment that everybody falls into, uh, he was talking about John the Baptist, he said everybody falls into the first dispensation, basically is the comment he made, uh, until the time of John the Baptist, because at that time, the pointing was going to who? Behold the Lamb of God. And so it was the beginning, Jesus said this is the beginning really, of not necessarily what we would call the, the church age yet, he hadn't known of the cross, but he was saying this is the time that's being spoken of in the new church age, and, and you fall into it. If you've heard of this gospel before I go to the cross, you're going to fall into this age, I believe is what he was saying. The forerunner of Jesus, John the Baptist, comes and says, Behold, the Lamb of God. Starting a whole new dispensation, a whole new age, you might say. All right, so we have the time of the cross. And we have the time at some point to the end, there's going to be a moment, there's going to be a time when this is going to be fulfilled. And I think that's the time of the Gentiles when it's fulfilled. And I, I like this verse, the reason I use this verse, because it says God is, uh, because it said that, uh, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, the blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles have come in. And I believe this morning he was talking about it, the state of Israel, the comments being made about Israel. And uh, I believe he was saying, look, this age is going to finish at some point. The fullness of the Gentile age is going to finish. And now, and then all the eyes are going to be opened up. I know a lot of them are being opened up now. We hear that from our missionaries, the many being saved in Israel. But there are, the entire nation is going to have their eyes open. It appears to me at the fullness of the end of the church, what we call the church age. You've got Adam to the law, the law to the cross. The church age to win. Until Jesus appears. And that's what we're talking about today, that blessed hope. All right, so let's go to the next thought. That was the first one. The second one is there's another reason for the rapture. When he comes back, he's going to pour his wrath out <coughs> on all those that would not believe. There's several scriptures. I, I just picked this one to be easy to go to when we're in the second when we're in uh, in this chapter if you want to, you're in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, just go back to the first chapter verse 10, and that's our verse that's one reason I, I picked this uh, this verse for this but he's kept us from wrath, he's called us to the blessings of God and he's going to keep us from his wrath we're not going to have to go through the wrath of God, verse 10 and to wait for his son this is uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10 and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. There's going to be a wrath poured out on this earth. And it's going to be something we can't even imagine. And you don't want to be here. You don't want to be here. You want to go and 
When Jesus comes back, you want to go in the rapture. Believe me, you do not want to be here when the Antichrist is in ruling and the one world system and and, uh, and it's going to be bad. And God's going to pour out his wrath. And at some point, of course, uh, you're even got eventually the, you know, the uh, uh, the millennium period and so on. But but uh, but here we have the church is not supposed to face and have to go through the wrath of God. And that's in more than one scripture. Look up the word wrath. Look through your New Testament and you'll find many scriptures that point to wrath. And uh, God pours out his wrath on sin and will pour it out even more on the unrighteous who he's even sent a delusion he says at the end of time. Because they would reject Christ and they would have a delusion and believe a lie. Alright, that's the second one. Let's go to the third one. This is a, a very, very important one for me and for all of us. Right now we're in these old bodies, aren't we? We're mortal. We're going to die one day. We got bodies that get sick. We got disease. We got sin. And this scripture tells us, these scriptures, I have two couple of them, that mortality might be swallowed up. That's our third one. We need rapture. There has to be a rapture because there has to be a time for these bodies to be swallowed up and we can get our new bodies, you know? And so uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if you want to turn there, of course, I haven't really talked about 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Uh, let me make a couple comments before we go to 1 Corinthians 15. I got so caught up myself that I forgot to even discuss the, the rapture itself. Um, I, I just want to read that those verses to you, those key verses. 1 Thessalonians 4, starting verse 16. He says, When the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, that means we're going to hear a, a shout. It's going to be a shout of the archangel. He says, with the voice of the archangel. Whether that's Michael, we don't know. The only two we really seem to, to know are called archangels. They're referred to as archangels. It would be Michael and Gabriel, scripturally. But who knows, maybe there's more than one or two. And with the trump of God, and that could be the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And so we see a shout. We're going to hear this noise. We're going to hear a trumpet. It reminds me, and I'm sure it reminds all the Christians in the day of Paul, that, that uh, especially they were Jewish Christians, I'm sure it made them think of Mount Sinai. They heard the trumpet when they're giving them the law. We're going to hear a trumpet when the giving of grace is complete. When Jesus breaks through and appears to me and to you, we're going to hear a trumpet. It was so terrible, the sound of it was so loud and so terrible at Mount Sinai that uh, the people couldn't stand it. They were afraid to put fear in their heart. They got goosebumps, all right, but it wasn't the goosebumps we like and with the blessings of God. It's the goosebumps of fear. And they said, oh, Moses, we, we can't hear this anymore. You talk to God. We, we can't handle all this. This is too much for us. Well, that was at Mount Sinai, probably the Jewish uh, Christians in the early church. When it said the voice of the archangel with the trump of God, the trumpet of God, I'm sure they thought of Mount Sinai, how terrible that had to be then, but guess what? For me and you, it's a glorious sound. For me and you, we're going to be out of here in the twinkling of an eye. We're going to read that scripture in a moment. And so uh, it says, and then, verse 17, just to make a couple more comments, and then we'll go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It says, then we which are alive, that's us today, if you came right now, and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's a glorious statement, church. That's a glorious thing. Amen. And you can see the, the monitor at all. You can see the rapture in the monitor there that we have up there. And so, anyway, we're going to hear a trumpet, a shout, a trumpet, and all of a sudden, in the twinkle of an eye, we're going to be caught up. And how's that going to happen? I mean, are you going to jump up and have wings, you know, like Superman? Well, that word called up is a word that has to do with being snatched away. God is going to literally snatch us away. It, it reminds me of the, the in, in school when we were kids, and we, they'd give us a big magnet, and we had these little filings, and you've all played with magnets, and, and, and it was so powerful compared to those little filings that it just zapped those little filings up to the magnet. That's what it's going to be like. We're going to be caught up. And, and that's what the Greek word implies. And one other comment, we're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 
15, uh, one other comment, and that's the fact that uh, the word rapture is, uh, is not in the scripture. <coughs> rapture, as I understand, it's been a funny, I didn't even look it up this message today, but, but it was, came basically, I think, from the uh, Latin Vulgate that Jerome wrote, and, and, and raptura, I think, was the word, and, and it was a Latin word that it refers to what we're talking about here today. And so if you look for the word rapture, don't try to find it in the Bible. That word's not there. Now, there's many, there's many, I'm told, that don't even believe in a rapture. Of course, that would be non-believers, wouldn't it? But you and I know it's true, and we're going to get a, a, a little different perspective of it in this verse here. We're going to begin reading in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. What we're here now, this is the third point of why and the third purpose of why there's going to be a rapture. All right, starting in verse 51. It says, Behold, I show you a mystery. That sounds like Paul done in the last two or three verses. I'll show you a mystery, and be not ignorant about this mystery. Sounds like Paul. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. In other words, we shall not all die. But we shall all be changed. Ah, dear church, we're talking. Mortality is going to be swallowed up. Paul talks about that more than once. And by the way, that comes from Isaiah chapter 25, verse 8, is where that terminology comes from in the Old Testament. Verse 52. In a moment, here it is. Listen. Keep looking because this is what's going to happen. In the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, or trumpet, for the trumpet shall sound. And the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible, these mortal bodies are corrupt, right? Must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when the corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the same that is written. Death is swallowed up, In victory. And that came from Isaiah chapter 25, verse 8. 55. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Couldn't keep Jesus in the grave, and guess what? It's not going to keep us in the grave either. It's not going to keep us while we're here on this earth. It, th th we're going to be raptured out of here. And that's what we need to keep looking up for, and that is our real hope, church. These old bodies, you suffer. These old bodies have disease. They're corrupt. And that's what he uses, corrupt. And they're vile. In fact, let's go to uh, one other verse that uh, has something about this as well. I saw this and I thought, well, this is worth reading today. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21. Listen to what Paul says about these bodies. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. In 21. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above. Oh, I'm, in, I'm sorry. I'm in, I am in Ephesians. I thought I recognized that verse. Uh, Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, 21. For our conversation or our communication, our lives, is in heaven. From whence also we look. There it is. We look. For the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile, you see that word? Vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able to even to subdue all things unto him. At this point, church, these bodies are corrupt, we have free will. And though we have his spirit in us, he's given us that ability of free will. And at times we make wrong choices. At times these, these uh, humiliating is one of the definitions. Depressing is another one of the definitions of the word vile. Uh, these humiliated bodies sometimes overcome us and we get into the weakness of our flesh. This vile, corrupt body. And, uh, and, and at that time, even though God is in control of all things, he's given us the ability He's given man the ability to make their own choices and pretty much live the way they want, whether they want to try to serve God in righteousness or not. And that's what's really uh, 
he's saying here is, is when he changes these bodies, at this time, we're not all in subjection in the fact that he's controlling in any way our choices. So when we get these new bodies, we'll be in total subjection to Jesus because we won't have these bodies <coughs> pulling us away. We won't have these bodies trying to get us to that inclination to sin or get into fleshly wants and desires or weaknesses of our flesh. And at that time, we'll be totally in his subjection because we won't have this earthly body fighting us. And we're told that the flesh wars against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. When we get to heaven, during the rapture, when we get there, we'll be totally subject to the, the spirit side of things, and we won't have these vile bodies, and we'll be in total subjection because we'll be under the total leading of the spirit of the living God. No more flesh warring against our spirit. No more us struggling against disease and, and this vile body of humiliation and depression and oppression and sickness and disease and, and addictions and all these things are going to be gone. That's our hope. While we're here, we're just aliens, the apostle tells us. We're just here as visitors until we fulfill our purpose, until the Lord Jesus Christ comes back. All right, so let us go to the next one. The hope of the church is to look up. Now I read in Titus, I read in Titus, in that first scripture, our key verse, looking for that blessed hope. That's what we're to do, church. I was, uh, as I was reading all this, I kept thinking more and more how, how more and more, especially as we get older, man, we need to be looking. In fact, as bad as things are getting, it looks like in our society and in this world, our hope is, is Jesus. We know that, but we need to be looking to him instead of all the stuff around us. It's all vanity. How did, Paul, how did uh, Solomon put it? It's all vanity and vexation of spirit. It's vexation that stresses us. It stresses our souls like it did Lot and Sodom. Uh, or, or I think it was Jude, that, or it was either Jude or Peter, that told us that God was able to deliver Lot out of of uh, Sodom, even though his soul was vexed with unrighteousness around him. Our souls right now in this world are being vexed, we're being pushed, we're being stressed, we're being oppressed by all this stuff, whether it be from TV, whether it be from the news, whether it be from just life in general, having trouble paying the bills, whether it be a sickness or disease, we're being vexed. And, uh, and that's what I think Solomon really ended up referring to. He says, everything in this old world is nothing but vanity. It's useless. It's temporary and vexation of spirit. All right, so uh, our hope, in other words, is looking up. He said, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. And then 1 Peter 1.13, uh, I just thought this was worthy to read. You don't have to turn there. It says, wherefore, gird up the little ones of your mind. In other words, he's telling us what to do. Be sober and hope to the end. In my notes here, in my Bible, I've got a little thing around. Hope to the end. Don't give up. Jesus is coming back. There is an end of this church age. He is coming back. And if you're in Christ, if you're in Him, if you're saved, if you're born again, washed in the blood of Jesus, and you, you know that you know that you know that He's your Lord and Savior, that you're going when Jesus comes back. And that's our hope. We need to be looking up into salvation. He says, and hope to the end for the grace of that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, I find it interesting the way that's worded. That's why I gave, brought us this verse today. In Titus, it tells us so much more, doesn't it, than, that we're just looking for the glorious God, our great God. Uh, but anyway, um, hope to the end, he says, at the revelation of Jesus Christ. I find several times, I didn't go back and look them up and count them, I find this terminology in the scriptures uh, three, four, five times or so or more. We're looking for the appearing of Jesus Christ. We're looking for the revelation of Jesus Christ. In other words, what the, the word apocalypse means, the book of Revelation, it is the uncovering. We're looking for the uncovering of the coming of our Lord when he shows himself and reveals himself for who he really is. He's going to come in glory. He's going to reveal himself to the world. And we get to see him in person and in truth. 
and we're going to get to see him as he really is when we have our bodies changed and we can finally look upon God and not be such a dreadful thing as we, if we looked upon God in our human state, state the way we are right now. And so this is, he says, be sober, hope to the end, for the grace, think about this, that's when our grace will be completed. He says, look, hoping to the end for the grace that is brought unto you. Did you hear that? We're going to have a grace that's being brought into us, and that grace is our new bodies. That grace is eternally live with the Lord. That's a grace, it's a favor that God's going to bless us with at the second coming of Christ. All right, the fifth one. The fifth one is to gather the church together as one. You know, we don't think about it, but we all know that through the history of the church, man, there's millions, millions of, of Christians that have died and gone on to be with God. There's some in heaven, and there's some in earth. And by the way, there's none in between. There's none in between. There is no purgatory. We're, we're, we're either with God there or here with, with God living this life and finishing this life. And there's got to be a time when God wants to gather his whole body together. And that's another reason for the, uh, uh, for the rapture. In Ephesians chapter 1, again, you don't have to, to turn there. In fact, I'll just read it to you. The first half of the verse It's a long verse. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10. He says that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, we're back to that fullness of the church age, he might gather together, there it is, that he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on the earth. And so one purpose for the rapture and one needful thing for the rapture is there's going to be a time when he's finally going to bring us all together. And again, as long as this world keeps on going as it is and, and there's, there's Christians walking the earth here in the gospel, people getting saved, as long as that's going on, we're not all together yet. But we can all rejoice and, and get that grace that Jesus said on the cross it is finished. You'll receive that crown that you're going to receive at the end. And then in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, you might want to turn there because that's where our main uh, text is going to be next. In 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, let me read these verses, and this is the purpose of the gathering of the church, where it mentions it here. Chapter 2 of 2 Thessalonians, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord, there's another way to word it, by the coming of our Lord, Jesus Christ. And by our gathering unto him. You see, there it is. Again, speaks of the gathering unto him. That ye be not soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. I believe that's the only place in Scripture where the terminology of the day of Christ. We see the day of God, we see the day of the Lord. But here he talks about the coming together with Christ as the second coming, as the coming of Christ. Make no question or doubt about it. Jesus is coming back. And I think he uses the word Christ on purpose. When we think of Christ, who does even the whole world think about? They even use it as slander, saying Jesus Christ, don't they? Christ, our Lord, our Savior. And so it says the day of Christ is at hand. In other words, it's near. All right, so there's a gathering that needs to be done to get us all together. That's a, that was my uh, fifth uh, reason. Now we're going to keep reading this chapter. These are the two I put together because of some other stuff. And we're going to look at this real quick. Uh, but there's a restraining that's going on right now of evil. And this text is, speaks about a restraining, in other words, something that's in the way of the Antichrist and the evil taking over totally, 100%. And, uh, and this text is talking about, so we're going to keep reading the verse. We read verse 2, start reading in verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day, which day? Well, he just said the day of Christ, the coming of Christ, right? 
shall not come except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all called God, or that is worshipped, so that he is God sitting, or he as God sitting in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was with you, I told you these things. That's verse 5. And now you know what withholdeth. What's holding the evil? What's holding the revelation of the Antichrist? What is holding that back? He says, now you know what's withholding, holding, that he might be revealed in this time. More than likely talking about Antichrist being revealed. Verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. In other words, sin's already in the world. The spirit of Antichrist is already in the world. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, there's the second coming again, him, even him, whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all deceitfulness of righteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. Now here's where he talks about the delusion. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they might be damned or condemned, who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. That delusion, by the way, God mentions also sending delusion to the people in this age. In Isaiah chapter 66, the very last chapter of Isaiah, which is a good way to remember where this is at, he says, I will give them their delusions. He speaks of it back then in the Old Testament. And then, and believe me, from what we see around us, I know my mind, you finally get over the shock, but my mind even now is, how can these people believe the stuff that I hear them say? How can they believe it? Well, it's very possible because they've rejected Christ, that God has sent a delusion. That's very possible. Uh, because they would not accept the truth. And that's what we have there. But let's go back to a couple things here and look at this. I want to look at verse 3. This is a very, very, some of these verses are very difficult. You really have to do some looking and some reading and checking these out. And I've done it probably a thousand times through the years. Uh, verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come. What day? The return of Christ. Except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Okay, now, I've been reading on Facebook this week, and what happens, as you can tell, it's the same one people keep pasting it, and, and they use it, because they want to proclaim their faith in Jesus Christ, which, and I'm all for it, just put as much as you want on Facebook, you know. But they've also got a set theology. And the fact that the Antichrist has to be revealed before the second coming. Now, I just want to throw this question out to you. This always bothered me because we've been taught this way pretty much through the years. If that is so, why are we looking for Jesus? How could we even expect him to come back right now? Has the Antichrist been revealed? Not that I know. So something, I've always had trouble with that. Something doesn't seem to line up. And through some studies, I went back and uh, I've done it before now, but I went back and did some looking at some of this stuff, and I want you to look at the words, the wording, a falling away first. I'm just going to give you some thoughts, okay? A falling away. Well, we all know this is what's taught, and we know it's true. We know that before the end of time, there's going to be many people leave the faith, many people fall away, and that's the wording, right? The English wording. Fall away. But if you do some more study on this, and I I caught it in one of my commentaries. I went and looked at some other commentaries and some men I respect and got some look at this a little closer and I I have to, I believe in my heart, I agree with them because that gets rid of that sense of why be waiting on the Lord? No, he can't come back. The man press hasn't been revealed. But what if that isn't what this verse is saying? So I'm just putting you some food out there. Don't just believe everything you've been taught, you know? Falling away. Yes, we know that Hearts are going to wax cold, Jesus said, right? And we know there is a falling away, and we do see it. Uh, the whole world is, 
It's getting worse and worse, falling away from the truth. But this word falling away means in its early, in fact, it was translated this way in even a couple of Bibles I hadn't even recognized when I saw one of the commentators talking about it and describing it. Uh, it, was, it was even in your Bible not saying the falling away, but the departing. The departing. Now let me just tie in another verse that will kind of connect with my, what I'm trying to say here. Could this be the departing of the church? That's what's been said in some of the earlier teachings by some great scholars. But somehow along the line it got changed to, well, we know that the falling away, just taking the English, right, the English words, we must recognize there's, it's been translated from the Greek. The departing. Now, let me say this to you. Now, listen to this closely and see if it doesn't give you a thought that maybe this is right. What has the Apostle Paul been talking about in First Thessalonians and now he's talking about again? The rapture. The coming of Christ. And we're going to be out of here. The departing, and I'm going to add these words, of the church. It fits. And I looked at a couple that I really respect, a couple of scholars, and they agreed that they felt that this is what it looks like it appears. I'm not saying this is it. I'm just saying this, this makes sense. It fits. It witnesses with me, but you have to look at it yourself. The departure is the church. Now, if the departure is the church, and it's the one that could be the one restraining, and that's got, we're going to look at that, uh, that has a couple different thoughts by different uh, scholars. That means when we stop restraining the evil, and we depart out of here, now the world is open to evil and the Antichrist takes over. It fits, it, it kind of makes sense as well. And so, the departure could be us getting out of here, church. Then, and there's where our theology goes against some of the posts I've been seeing on Facebook. Because they say, the, the, the way it's worded, you know that the Antichrist is supposed to come first, and then we're going to get raptured out of here. And, but I want everybody to know today, I believe in the rapture, and I believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. And they're making a confession of their faith, and that's great. But the theology may not be right. It, there's a good chance that the departure is the church. And when we depart, then the Antichrist will be revealed. We won't be here. Food for thought. Now, let's go to verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity, sin, and all this end time corruption and unrighteousness, doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let. Now he who let it will let until he be taken out of the way. Talking about the same thing. Who's the one that's withholding? There were some scholars in the earlier days that said, well, it was Rome. Well, that didn't do it, did it? Rome didn't finish up their power government and all of a sudden the Antichrist was revealed. It obviously wasn't Rome. And I, I read a scholar, um, one of the scholars, and I thought, how could he have said that? Because I mean, he wasn't back in the time of Rome. He should have even known that it wasn't Rome. But anyway, uh, some say it's Rome. I was wondering if I even listed them here. I did not, I don't think. Oh, yeah, some said Rome. Some said the governments. Is what, and what we're talking about here is this restraining. This is another reason why the church needs to go. It, we're restraining evil. Some said Rome. Some said the governments were holding back the evil. And there's some truth to that. We've got governments all around the world, and you've got laws. Break the laws, you go to jail. It does restrain evil. That's the purpose of, of many of the laws in the land, most of the laws in the land. Some said the Holy Spirit. Some said the Church of God. Some say the body of Christ. And I say amen to all of those last three. Because it's God that's restraining evil through the church, I believe. We are a body, and it says he, and I even circled that in my mind. It says he, that's letteth is letting. But who's he? God. I mean, we are the bride, so you say, well, it's not the church, but we are the body of Christ, which is a he, right? So he that is restraining evil now will do it as long as God 
And that says restrain evil. And then the church, the departure takes place. Then the Antichrist takes over and evil goes crazy. Then there's going to be the wrath of God go way up. And so, uh, anyway, so we're here. We need to be a second coming, what we are calling the rapture, because it's a restraining force. You may not realize it, but even you're just being a good moral person, not giving in to all the evil of the world. You're restraining evil. In fact, you're restraining evil in yourself, if nothing else. Did you ever think about that? Most of it we find out is about us becoming more like Christ, overcoming and getting victory over the sins of our own lives. We're restraining evil. We're getting victory over the evil that's even in our human lives. And then we become more like Christ each time. And so God is the one that's the restraining force. He's using the church, the Holy Spirit, the body of Christ, and, uh, and restraining it, but at some point there's going to be the departure. Church will go out. All right, the last one. The last one is to prepare the way for the Antichrist. It really goes with the last one that we just did that I put down in a second. It's going to prepare the way for the Antichrist and eventually the millennium. There must be an end to the age. It began with Christ at the cross when the new gospel of grace coming in from the law. And it's going to be until the last. There's going to be a day. I believe there's going to be a day when the last Gentile makes Christ their Savior. It's going to be the fullness. It's going to be the fullness of the time of the Gentiles, which is the church age. And then we're out of here. Israel's eyes will be opened as well. And, uh, and so there's some basic theology for you. And so we're going to there's a, there's a rapture, that's what we're talking about today. Second coming of rapture. Because it's got to prepare the way. Jesus has to prepare the way for the very end of it all. And you and I aren't supposed to be in the midst of his wrath. So uh, I'll finish with this. Uh, good stuff. Good stuff. Can you hear it? Is that a shadow here? Shout's gonna be. If that's a shout, then I'm turning off the trumpet. Wow. He's coming. Are you ready? He's gonna come with a shout, the sound of a trumpet. It's the voice of the archangel is the shout, the sound of a trumpet. And then in a twinkling of an eye, church, in a twinkling of an eye, man, we're going out of this place. Just keep looking. The end is close, and you know it. I've never seen so many people, even on Facebook, talk about the end is close, we're at the end of time. We all know it. God's preparing us to look up. Look up, church. He's coming. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this word. Come, Holy Spirit. Speak to our hearts that there is an end. Speak to our hearts to look up. Speak to our hearts to repent if we're not right. Speak to our hearts, oh God, that we be able to depart with the departure. Come, Holy Spirit, we pray. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. My people know if you need prayer, just come and sit on the front pew and we'll gather together as a body and we'll pray for you if you need prayer today. So just come to the front and just praise the name of Jesus. Just look up, church, and listen.